Yeah, so, um, yeah, so, you know, I mean, I've been giving talks here since uh, 2013, at least, right? On a more regular basis, but, you know, over the years, you know, it comes, came like once or two months and then. But this year, you know, I've, uh, you know, Jess, the owners, kind of asked me to come back to give a series of talks this year. So, this is the second in the talk for this year. I think there'll be another three more at least. Right? And I think the next one, uh, Probably in July, and it's going to be on uh, you know our wine centennial year, so it's going to be on like 200 years of Singapore art. So it's going to be on, on Singapore art, and, and so. But you know, I'm thinking how to condense everything into you know, right into one hour, 200 years of art history into one hour. Okay, but anyway, that's that's uh, you know, uh, two months later. Okay. Um. All right. So this is the uh, the, the the topic, right, for today's uh, talk. Right, it's called articulation. Okay, so it's a, there's a different way of, of, uh, of the word here. And uh, how to see, understand, and talk about the painting. I suppose uh, it's not, I suppose what you kind of take home today, right? It's, it's not really so much, I mean, you know, it's not only to enable you to talk, be able to be, uh, in a sense, uh, you know, be smart when you talk to someone about art, but you know, in future as well, if you want to write about art, I think, you know, what what will be said here today will be applicable as well, right, when you write about art. Okay? Because when you look at art, um, you know, you can talk about it, you can also write about it. But of course, when you write about it, you require probably, a, you know, different sets of skills, right? But I think the fundamentals are still the same, right? The fundamentals of looking, for example. Okay, I mean, you know, for those who have been here early, earlier, or of course, you know, you have been, I'm sure you have been to museums, exhibitions, um, and you have seen paintings, um, you know, but, you know, I'm wondering, I'm not taking a survey or anything like that, right? but I think it would be interesting, you know, to, to know, right, maybe a few of you can respond, you know, what's the first thing, you know, when you look at a painting, right, what's the first thing that, you know, that you see or that comes or that you're thinking about, okay, or that you're responding, right? What's the first thing that you respond to okay, when you look at a painting? Or what the, what's the first thing that grabs your attention, you know? Anyone? Color. Sorry? Color. 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 Oh, the color. thank you. Color. Wow, that's interesting. Yes. Yes. Appeal. Uh, appeal. Uh, does it appeal to you? Appeal. 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 Oh, appeal. Yeah. Okay, in, in what way? I mean, can you... Uh, uh, I might like the painting or I might not like it at all. Ah. It could be a modern art and I might not like right, it. Not, right, right. Just right. does not go along with me. Sure. So if you don't like the painting, what do you do then? I don't look at it. Oh. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah, Frank, thank you. You know, yeah. you're very honest. Um, yes. Any, anyone else? Gesture. Gesture. Oh, I mean, in, in terms of... Uh, can you explain more maybe? Uh, mark making. Mark making, okay, right. right. Sure. Hmm. Not, okay. not many people kind of uh, take notice of that, you know, until much later, you know. I mean, when you look deeper, then yeah, but interesting. Creativity? Creativity. Creativity. Something different which is out of the ordinary, which you don't see. Sure, sure, sure. I think that will catch your attention as well. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Right. Hmm. Anyone else? Maybe one or two more. Medium. Medium. Okay. So you, you what sense medium? I mean, like, uh, certain medium appeals to you, I suppose, or? Um, not that it, it appeals, but um, it's well. It, in some sense, it does appeal. I mean, it, it, it makes you question, like, why? What is the artist trying to convey? Sure. That to you? Sure. Those are good questions. You know? Yeah. Yeah. With the medium, what what is the artist trying to do? Okay. Um, I think. Yeah. I think those are very valid questions that we should ask. Um, any other thoughts? I would think like years when his painting was done, whether relatable to that particular period or colonial period or post-war period. Interesting. So, yeah. Because uh, that actually goes beyond, uh, you know, that's actually uh, uh, thinking in terms of context already, right? That's also, you know, I'll be covering that today, right? The kind of broader context, right? uh, when it was made, you know? And that's important, that's very important. Thank you for your response. Um, you know, and uh, yeah, and, and I mean, all of you. I mean, those are all valid kind of points. And, right. I just want to kind of start 
um, I, I mean, your notes, you know, I kind of made a few, not many, but a few additions and you know, a couple of memories, but uh, I don't think you have this uh, cartoon here. So this cartoon, you can see the, the word. It says, instead of, it sucks, you could say, it doesn't speak to me. <laughs> But I hope you didn't say it sucks. Right? <laughs> Maybe that's your, you know, your kind of uh, your response to the world. Um, yeah. I mean, it's true. I mean, you know, in, in fact, the, the kind of words we use, right, when we talk about painting, um, also matters. So you know, the I mean, really the I won't say the polite, right? I don't, I don't think it doesn't speak to me. I mean, it's polite, but. It's the right way to respond as well when someone asks you about a, a work of art. You know? yeah, it doesn't speak to me. Okay, because, uh, you know, um, a painting, right, is said that, you know, um, it's supposed to speak to you. Right? You're supposed to, to respond, right, to the, to the, for example, the colors, you know, it could be the line of the painting, okay, or it could be other kind of elements of the painting. Right? So, so in effect, when you look at a painting, right, you don't actually need a mediator or a critic, art historian. Okay, because uh, a work of art, right, is supposed to speak directly to you. And there's this uh, quote by Ed Reinhardt. Okay, Ed Reinhardt is, uh, I would consider him to be a minimalist artist. Right, and he's uh, famous. He's an American artist, famous for his uh, very abstract black paintings. Okay, and he says, uh, "Looking is not as simple as it looks." Right, and who is most, you know, appropriate to say this than Ed Reinhardt? Because when he looked at his painting, I think his painting was shown at a minimalist show that recently closed at the National Gallery. Okay, it's, uh, it appears all black. Okay, but when you look closer, right, you can see shapes in the painting. Because it plays with you know different shapes of black. Okay, you can see, for example, a cross or some other shapes. So it plays with our perception. With our perception. So yeah, so it's valid when it says you know looking is not as simple as it looks. And I have to, to kind of um, say that you know whatever paintings you see here, you know, don't really do justice to the works. You have to go to the museum itself, right? And you know, look at that work face to face. Because then you can appreciate the skill, right? Uh, the colors, which you can't do, you know, on the slide. Anyone doesn't know this painting? <laughs> okay. Right. How many of you have seen this painting? Person, not on the books. Okay, well, yeah, I saw it again uh, in, uh, uh, in February when I was in Paris. And um, well, it's the Mona Lisa, right? The most famous, uh, you know, lady in painting, I suppose. And, uh, and, and, and the most uh, famous painting in the world, and the most popular. Okay, but bear in mind, I didn't say the greatest, right? Because that's another argument altogether, right? It's certainly the most famous and uh, the most uh, popular. But one can argue whether it's the greatest painting of the time. Um, so, so when you look at this painting, for example, right? No, what comes into your mind? I mean, that is if you have a chance even to look at it close up, because often, that's the problem. <laughs> it's like, when I was there, I think it's off peak, so it's not too bad. You know? It's like two or three kind of people deep. But, you know, this one is like 10 deep, and, you know, and, and it's shown at a distance, and, you know, behind a bulletproof glass. So you could hardly see anything, really. So, you know, but I suppose you can see enough to, to ask yourself, you know, certain questions, right? Especially in books, when you look at this painting. What are the questions to ask? I don't know whether it's occurred to you. 
I mean, look at this painting, you know, we can at least uh, have about 15 basic questions or more. Alright, and all these are questions that we can ask. And again, I'll, I'll bring you through, I mean, you know, hopefully it's not too heavy, but you know, I'll try to kind of uh, simplify certain terms. Um, oh, there's another one. Very important title. Okay. Um, of course, you know, starting with the title, that's the first clue you'll get when you look at a painting. In the first clue. And it's important. Look at the title. I know artists today, contemporary artists, you know, they, they don't want to kind of affix titles to their work. Okay, because they don't want, you know, to kind of lead you to certain uh, conclusions about the work. Okay, but I think titles are important, especially, you know, when you talk about um, pre-modern paintings. Because when you come to a modern period, you know, where you, it's dominated by abstract art, abstract painting, you know, artists uh, somehow, you know, they, they, they kind of uh, give very technical um, titles of their painting. Uh, things like uh, number one, number two, right, number three. Okay, so, um, which, which really doesn't you know, tell you a lot. Okay, but I think in, uh, for, for pre-modern, uh, I think even for contemporary paintings, okay, uh, I think that the title, um, right, it is really your first clue as right, to so what the painting is about. Okay, but the painting, the title of this painting here is Mona Lisa. Right? In Italian, it's called La Giaconda. Okay, the smiling one. Okay, do you all know what Mona Lisa means? Ever thought of that? Mona is a kind of an honorific title. It's like man, you know, man. And Lisa is the first name of this woman, Lisa Gallardini. She's the wife of a, a Florentine silk merchant. I mean, we are told by Vasari, right? Vasari was the biographer of Renaissance artist. Okay, so, well, this is a portrait of a person. Apparently, you know, uh, I mean, at that time, you know, only wealthy people got their portraits done. Mm -hmm. But what's so fascinating about this painting? You know, that makes it so, so famous. But anyway, we'll come, we'll come to that. But, these are some questions we can ask, and today, you know, we're going to look at some of these questions, right? So on the left, okay, one of the first things, okay, normally when, when we look at a painting, is to describe it. Okay, we describe it, we, you know, we describe what we call the formal qualities of the work. The line, the colors, textures, composition, right, etc. We'll, we'll, I'll come to that uh, right later on. And then you begin to ask yourself, right, second stage. The narrative qualities. What's the subject? Right, you see a lady here. Okay, but who exactly is she? Um, you know, and then uh, you know it covers things like content as well. Right, what's the content of the painting? And then you need to go deeper. What's the meaning of, right, of this painting? Um, okay, and then of course you ask things like the medium, the methods, the techniques. For this painting, you know, um, Leonardo used, uh, you know, uh, chiaroscuro, okay, the contrast of light and dark, okay, to model the figure. And he also used a sfumato. Sfumato is uh, Italian for smokiness, you know, to kind of um, make certain parts of the painting, uh, you know, ambiguous, and to give a certain kind of mystery as well, right, to the painting. And then um, we we'll ask ourselves on the right, you know. Question, broader questions, okay, contextual questions, right? Who commissioned it? It's quite important to know that. Who commissioned the painting? For what? For who? Okay, and then, uh, you know, so we look at the painting as well in, in terms of its broader social, cultural, economic, historical context. And uh, intention also sometimes is important. Okay, why was the work made? In what purpose did it serve? And um, yeah, so so Leonardo was commissioned to do this portrait. Um, you know, by by as I mentioned, right, the, the rich uh, Florentine merchant. 
Now let me go back to the uh, Is also, you know, she's uh, famous for her smile, right? But the question is, if you look hard enough, is she really smiling? Is she really smiling? Yeah. Um, anyway, um, but as I say, you know, this uh, this painting, so this portrait, is uh, also famous because of uh, innovative methods that Leonardo used that were not used before. So that's why you know, it's, it's considered to be uh, a very important work. Right? He employed, uh, for example, you know, the, the, the format itself, a three-quarter pose. Okay? Um, you know, the, the hand, the right hand on top of the left. Okay? This were to set kind of precedence for subsequent portraits in Italy. Okay? So it's a very important painting. Okay, but you know, I can spend an hour talking about this painting, you know that, but you know, I, I just use this to illustrate you know, the, the kind of questions that we can ask right, about this painting. Okay, these are just like a dozen or so questions. Okay, um, yeah, condition of the work as well. Okay, because we need to know that this work has been darkened by, you know, over the years because of the varnish use. So we have to understand. So it has become darkened. Um, so it's not as pristine or as bright as it once was. So we have to bear that in mind when we look at paintings. <clears throat> okay, that it was not in the condition that it was once was. Now, does the title of the work or art matter? Yes, I think it's important. Um, as I said, you know, it's, um, I don't know whether it's because of laziness or something, right? But some of every artist you know, avoid giving you know titles to their works okay, because uh, I think they don't want it to be too prescriptive. And, um, anyway, um, yeah, because words can affect our perception of a work of art. Okay, but as I said, you know, look at the title first. I think it's important. Because it will give you a clue to the right to the work itself. Okay, I think before we go on, I think we need to um, clarify certain terms. Okay, I think it's important. I don't know whether you are familiar with these terms. Okay, so we have, I mean, really, art history can be kind of categorized broadly into these uh, three kind of um, periods. Okay, so the first period is really, I mean, we can add another period before this. It's the ancient, ancient art, perhaps. Right? So maybe traditional art is used to describe not art from the beginning, I would say, but for the purposes of painting, I would say art from the Renaissance, maybe about 15th century onwards, okay, to about the middle of the 19th century. Okay, and during this time, you know, art served uh, religion. Mainly, mainly the, the, the Christian faith, the Catholic faith. Okay, they serve the state, the elites of society. So you can see, you know, art during this time was really for the elites. I mean, even today. Okay, Jeff Koons rarely just sold for what? Malcolm, right? Malcolm, I kind of, he's a fan of Jeff Koons. Uh, 90 million or 91. Staggering. Um, anyway, that's just a kind of diver, uh, and you have to know very importantly that traditional art okay, is preoccupied with subject matter. Okay? Subject right, of the painting was very important okay, to, to this uh, you know to this uh, artist who lived uh, during this period. Okay, and then you move on to modern art. So modern art, I mean after this, what happened is that there was a kind of rebellion by the Impressionists. Okay. The Impressionists uh, uh, led by Claude Monet. Okay. They reacted against traditional art. They found traditional art extremely dry, you know, painting the same old thing, you know, religion, myth, right? 
in the same style again and again. So they rebelled okay, and uh, you know they, they kind of um, uh, develop their own style of painting. I mean, if, I, I'm sure you have seen you know, impressionist works, uh, right? And and impressionist works were, were of course I mean to them subject was still important, but more importantly to the impressions that you know the 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 how you paint became more important than what you paint. Okay, um, yeah, a bit, just a bit of advertisement. <laughs> yeah, I also run short courses and um, currently running <coughs> one Asian art introduction, a seven week course, you can use a skills feature and all that, you know. So I think in uh, September, right, um, there's going to be a seven week course on impressionist and post impression. So I'm offering that for the first time. That'll be in September. But you can always email me to check it out. Okay, uh, anyway, coming to modern art. Okay, modern art uh, really is, was really from the about the mid 19th century, 1860s to the 1960s. Okay, when artists, as I mentioned earlier, began to rebel. Okay, against the system, and the system here was represented by the academies. Okay, art, for example, in France and also in places like England. It, uh, you know, was dominated by the academies. And the academies will tell you, you have to paint this way, that way, it has to be big, right? it has to be detailed. Okay, those were the academies. So, what the uh, artists, uh, you know, like the Impressionists and some of their precursors, they rebelled against academic art. Okay, they developed their own way of painting. Okay, so modern art really was, uh, you know, a reaction against traditional art, against academic art. Okay, it's a rejection of tradition, okay, and um, and so uh, modern art is characterized a lot by innovation. Okay, so you are talking about this period, artists were extremely, you know, innovative in terms of coming up with uh, new methods of painting, new techniques, art forms, right. Okay, so, some of the greatest artists lived during this time, Picasso, Matisse, right? Kandinsky, people like that. Okay, so, um, and of course, you know, modern art didn't happen out of the blue. It responded to certain conditions, right? Urbanization, the Industrial Revolution, right? Developments like this. Okay, so you have to understand that art always responded to social you know, political economic situations. And lastly, you have contemporary art. Okay, what you call post-modern, after the modern. Okay, I mean, contemporary art is still a term we use today. Okay, um, I mean, it's the most basic, contemporary art refers to the art of today. Okay, but it also is used to refer to certain kind of uh, characteristics of art okay, that was different from the modern. And uh, what well, we can kind of, I mean, it emerged really from about the 1950s, 1960s onwards. Okay, when uh, artists began to feel that, you know, modern art was a bit out of touch with reality. Because, you know, modern art was dominated by abstract art. And there's really nothing much to see by abstract art, you know, except for colors and lines. And, and how many people can appreciate that? It's, it's very difficult. Right to, to appreciate um, abstract art. I know people, you know, today still continues to dismiss abstract art as something that is, you know, rubbish. Or, you know. And um, anyway, they, they, they began to. They felt that art should, you know, be, be. There should be a kind of a bridge between art and life. Okay? Art has to reflect the realities of life. Okay, so, um, so what, uh, you know, um, so postmodern, I mean, contemporary artists, they began to deal with uh, art, okay, that uh, reflects issues, issues in life, okay, social issues, political, you know, uh, something to do with race, gender, politics, you know, etc. And, um, and of course, you know, uh, with contemporary art as well, uh, it became a bit more inclusive. 
Okay, one can say that you know modern art is a kind of all boys club. You know, I mean, it's really dominated by male artists. Okay, for example. Okay, and uh, and contemporary art is also a bit more populist. But of course, today if you look at the development of contemporary art, it has become a little bit more elitist. You know, right? No longer that accessible. Uh, you know, and and yeah, it's getting quite difficult to to appreciate nowadays. Anyway, you know, some people say that art may come full circle again, you know, so you go back to Renaissance, you know, classical art, but, you know, let's see, you really don't know. Okay, I'll give you some examples. So this example of traditional or academic art, you know, pre-modern art. Okay, this was uh, painted in 1847 by Thomas Kutcher. And the title is Romans of the Decadence. So the title is important, Romans of the Decadence. But then you might, you might wonder, painted in 1847, why is the subject still Romans? Well, as I mentioned, you know, it's something that was required by the academies, right? Okay, because the academy, you know, required artists to make references back to classical times, to Greek times, Roman times. Okay, so artists uh, make references back to classical times in different ways. Okay, for example, in the case of this painting, you know, what do you see? There is classical, there is Roman. The columns, Corinthian columns, right? Those are used in Roman times. The, the dress of the people, the costume. And of course, the Romans were famous also for what? For their decadence. For the decadence and um, okay so anyway and you see also classical kind of sculptures as well okay but you know so that's the kind of subject we, we you know we see okay but of course there's a kind of broader kind of meaning to this work um, I suppose you know Thomas Kutcher wanted to use this painting to talk about contemporary French society. Okay, at that time you have to understand that, you know, I think it, was, it wasn't too long before the French Revolution. Right? Okay, so, so there was this, um, you know, kind of rebellion, okay, against, um, right, against, against the ruling party and all that, right, against the monarchy. Okay, so I think, I think there's a kind of, um, a deeper kind of layer of meaning in this painting. Right, to talk about the decadence of French society itself. But again, come back to this point that, you know, this is what you call an academic painting. It's huge. It's in the Louvre, by the way. If you go to the Louvre, right, in uh, Paris, you see this. And the Academy's favorite paintings that are more than two meters, right, uh, in length. And the favorite paintings which are meticulous and detailed. Right? I mean, if you look at Claude Monet, okay, I'm good. Oh, I don't have a Claude Monet, but. You know, you know what I mean. If you look at Claude Monet, when compare with this, right? Okay. There was one comment that Monet's, you know, some of his paintings are unfinished, but actually they are finished. Mm -hmm. So detailed, meticulous. It deals with um, certain subjects that are favored by the academies, right? In this case, classical subject history, religion is another one, myth. Okay. So to be a successful painter at that time. You, you know, you have to paint like this. And um, in fact, this painting won the gold medal at the Salon. How was the Salon? S-A-L-O-N. The Salon was the annual exhibition of the French Academy. So the French Academy holds an annual exhibition. And this painting won the gold medal. You know how difficult it is to get a gold medal? Over 5,000 entries. Okay, so once you get a gold medal, you are you are made for life. You know? Probably didn't have to work. You, know? you get, you get client, you know, clients, collectors buying your works and all that. Okay, uh, let's move on. Okay, I have to point out that this was exactly the kind of painting that um, Monet, Renoir, you know, Degas, they rebelled against. Okay, this was the kind of painting they rebelled against. And as you know about the Impressionists, they painted contemporary life. Like they were not interested in this subject matter. Oh. 
Um, and his most famous series is uh, Homage to the Square. And you have done hundreds of these, either in paint or in print. Hundreds of these. They are no different. They use a square as a motif, right? And uh, you know, and, and kind of um, putting one square on top of another. Okay, and the only kind of difference are the colors used. So really, I mean, if you look at Albert's Homage to the Square series, it's really a kind of exploration of color relationships. And you know, you treat colors like actors, you know, right? They, have, they each have personalities. And, uh, you know, and we are told that, you know, in, in uh, Albert's studio, right? You know, he had 80 different kinds of yellow. I can't see 80 different kinds of yellow, it's amazing. Anyway, you know, as I said, he, he plays again with the uh, optical illusion, right? Because when you look at this painting, you know, this series of paintings, uh, he plays with the effects of the, the, the shapes, you know, receding or, you know, advancing towards us, right? Depending on the, the colors used, right? And also, you know, for example, the yellow could bring out the, 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 the dull color like gray, right? It plays, it juxtaposes against it. And so he plays with all these effects. So that's ex exactly what modern artists were interested in. Okay, they were interested more in uh, the manipulation of formal qualities. In this case, shapes. Uh, not so much shape, but colors. Color relationships. So, you know, and really in terms of subject, what else can you say? There's really no subject. Right? Besides it being a square. But of course, you know, with, with abstract art as well, you can talk about the context, the broader context. Okay, for example, a question to ask is, why were artists, you know, making abstract art? Okay, why were, why, they, why were they not, you know, making art that kind of, you know, figurative art or, you know, some other art like this? Of course, there are artists who make those kind of art, but, you know, you have a lot of artists making abstract art as well, abstract paintings. Okay, so that's a kind of a broader question to ask as well. Okay, anyway, you get the idea, right? This is modern art. Okay, it is, uh, you know, kind of marked by a kind of innovation, you know, artists try to be innovative, okay, original as well. And this is an example of uh, contemporary art. Okay, a contemporary painting. Ross Blackner, today is a commercially, highly successful commercial, you know, artist. Um, been around the scene for a long time, since the 80s, okay, since when uh, the AIDS outbreak first occurred. Okay, and, um, you know, and, and Blackner himself uh, saw many friends die, right, succumb to the disease. And uh, many of his paintings, you know, uh, are tribute right, to friends who have where died, right, the it is. Um, so this work is called In Sickness and In Health. Now, yeah, maybe if I didn't have that, that kind of text on there, right, um, you, you might not be able to tell what it is. So sometimes uh, when you look at painting, of course you might not know what it is, right? If, I mean, if the, the label is just in sickness and health, but as I said, it could give you a clue as well. Okay, so that's a very good clue. Okay, so you might be thinking, well, I mean, some of you might get it, you know, because you, you think, I mean, there's still really no wrong or right answer. Okay, as long as, you know, you, you can kind of substantiate what you say. Okay, so uh, here, those kind of rounded forms that you see there, right? Some look like bubbles and all that. Okay, it might remind someone of cells, right? Okay, like it is cells, and uh, or it could be something else. Okay, but you know, judging by the title, okay, um, and and if you know what Blackner has been dealing with in his paintings, I mean, you know, there are tributes to friends who have died through AIDS. Okay, you'll probably be able to guess that you know this work also. You know, it's something to do with that. So, very 
appealing painting, attractive in terms of the pastel color use. Okay, but talking about more kind of serious issue here. Right, about cells being invaded okay, by the HIV virus. Okay, so, so what I'm saying is that for contemporary painting, right, it's, those are abstract forms. I mean, well, I mean not entirely abstract like Albert Square, you know. I mean, in a sense they are in a sense organic. Okay, but but still, I mean, you can't really tell what they are. Right, but uh, they for contemporary painting, these kinds of work, even works like this, kind of carry a deeper meaning. They always have a message to tell. Okay, and um, in this case, a message about AIDS. Okay, so I already mentioned the contemporary painters. In their work, they deal with uh, you know social political kind of uh, issues. Okay, even uh, you know, I mean, if, if you find, I mean, there's uh, artists who contemporary artists who paint in a totally abstract way with just shapes and colors. Okay, but those shapes and colors refer to certain things in society, like prison cells. You know, I mean, Peter Halley's paintings, for example. You know, right? They look abstract, but he actually uses paintings to talk about contemporary society. Right? So they represent conduits, you know, computer circuitry, prison cells, apartment blocks, and things like that. Okay? So you can see the differences, right? So I've shown you three examples of um, kind of traditional painting, modern painting, and contemporary painting. Okay, so especially when you when you go to museums or galleries, when you look at contemporary painting. I look deeper, that chances are that you know, there will be a, a kind of a deeper kind of issue or right that the artist wants to convey to the painting. Now don't worry about this chart, okay? It's uh, quite easy to understand. Just that you know, when I kind of uh, teach my students to appreciate art, uh, I always tell them there are three ways to do it. Okay, and uh, Normally, when you look at a painting, okay, all these three can and should be applied. Okay, so, um, but as I said, it depends on the painting. Okay, so for example, um, an ab abstract painting, the one um, that I showed you earlier, Joseph uh, Albers painting. Okay, the one, the square, the homage to the square series. Now, for that painting, of course, you can't use theme to talk about it because theme is you know to talk about the subject matter the meaning the content so for that kind of painting you want to use form more so the form here refers to the formal qualities of the work okay the design elements line colors textures um, you know composition and how these are affected by other things like the medium used the techniques the processes so the most at the most basic level, okay, when you look at a painting, okay, these are the questions you should ask first, right? The formal qualities of the work, okay, the design elements of the painting, and then you go to the theme, right? What the work is about. You look at the subject, okay, and of course you know like Blackness work, right? The subject is not enough. You need to look deeper. So what, you know, what uh, kind of issues, right? Is he talking about? Okay, and then you talk about meaning. Are there kind of uh, uh, you know deeper meaning to the work? Are there more layers of meaning to the work? And then the context itself. Okay, the context is asking the broader questions. Right? I, I mean, uh, I kind of uh, mentioned this earlier. Okay, when, where, for whom, why was the work created? Okay, so you look at the personal, social, cultural context. Right, religious context of the work. Okay, so. So normally in a painting, you can apply this three kind of uh, methodology okay, to, to analyze a painting, to look at a painting. I mean, it's not good enough to just stop at, I mean, you can stop at form. That means disregard everything else, right? Just look at the colors, lines. Okay, but normally, you know, form and, and, and team, okay, they are all linked together, right? You can't really separate them. Or most of the time, you see. So, using formal analysis to look at the work. Now, formal here doesn't 
apply or mean uh, not the formal that we know, like formal clothing, you know? Right? Okay, it refers to, um, I mean, the, the, the prefix itself is form, so it refers to the form of the work, right? So what gives rise to the form of the work? Things like colors, lines, textures, shapes, etc. Right? So, so this is what we call formal analysis. So this is a quote by Frank Steller. Right? My painting is based on the fact that what only what can be seen there is there. It really is an object. You can see the whole idea without any confusion. What you see is what you see. Okay, I mean Stella here, I mean Stella is an American artist. He's famous for his uh, his early works were what he called stripe paintings. You know, they're just um, stripes on black kind of background. Okay, what's shown here again at the minimalist show. That ended, I think, uh, just a month ago. And he's uh, trying to tell you that, well, you know, there's nothing beyond what you see. All right? What you see is what you see, right? That means his works don't convey anything else, any moral messages or any kind of uh, broader social political issues. Right? Okay, so he's trying to tell you that it's uh, kind of a pure um, abstract painter. Okay, so formal analysis really is an explanation of the, the visual structure of a work. Right, so how the, the different kind of visual elements of a work or formal elements come together, right, are arranged, are composed or designed okay, to, to give rise to a certain form or to, to give certain visual effects or visual appearance. Okay, so this is what formal form analysis is about. So strictly speaking, subject is not considered, and neither is context. Okay, but as I said, you cannot avoid it. Right? Normally, um, I mean, unless you're talking about an abstract painting, then you know there's no subject really to speak of. But sometimes there's a context to, to talk about. <coughs> so these are the um, formal elements. Okay, line, I mean, there are, there are I don't, dozens of ways that artists use lines, or even hundreds of ways. Deep lines, thin lines, curved lines, straight lines, you know, you know I mean, the list goes on. Uh, shape, different kinds of shapes. Okay. I mean, here I'm not talking only about like shapes that are obvious, but shapes, you know, for example, certain shapes can be formed by a group of figures in a painting. You know, those kind of shapes, right? So what, what kind of shapes do you see in a painting? I mean, Elder's one is quite obvious. It's square, right? Of course, some others are not so obvious. Uh, so, but those are the kind of shapes that I'm talking about. Uh, colors, of course, you know, different hues of colors. Okay, there are many colors. Whether, are they primary colors? Favored by the artist? Secondary colors? Okay. For example, the uh, impressionists. Now, why why are their works? Why would why do their works look so vibrant? Because they use complementary colors. Right. Okay, and uh, so so colors is another kind of yeah, important element. Space, whether it's three dimensional space or you know whether um, is is uh, the painting is flat, okay, on the surface, right? Tone as well. Whether there's light and dark, contrast of light and dark, texture. Okay, whether you know the the fruits or the food in a still life is good enough to touch or to eat, you know, textures, right? Whether it gives a tactile kind of effect. Composition as well, all the different elements are, are kind of arranged. Rhythm, repetition. Okay. Do, do the um, artist repeat certain shapes? Okay, if they repeat certain shape then you know what's the intention? Okay, how does it affect? Right? Um, the appearance of the of the work. Okay, what effect kind of you know do those kind of rhythms give to the work? Balance, proportion, scale. Now scale of course is uh, two things here, right? The scale of within the painting itself. Okay, you can you can see different kind of sizes or scale, but scale in terms of the viewer relative to the painting as well. I think that's important. 
So those are the formal elements, and I just have another chart here. So you start with line shapes, as I mentioned, all the formal elements, and of course these are affected by the kinds of media or mediums used, techniques. Okay, so of course I think you know, I mean for painting with oil, watercolor, acrylic, tempera, etc. All of them give different effects. Okay, and uh, you know, and artists apply these mediums in different ways. Like Pollock later you'll see they pour paint on canvas. Some will use a brush, so different ways, different techniques. All these compose combine to produce effects such as rhythm, balance, pattern, etc. And this forms what you call the composition. Okay? So what you get is the composition itself, arrangement of shapes, lines, colors. And then of course this gives rise to the form, the form of the work. Okay? And then lastly, you know. All these kind of different ways in which artists use the formal elements, right? Is actually their style, right? So every artist has a different style. So these are some of the the, the questions we ask about, you know, formal elements, okay? What first attract your attention? Okay, what does the artist emphasize vision? Now to add that, um, artist intention is um, important. Yeah, but, but today of course you know you can also downplay the artist intention. You know more kind of um, uh, I mean the viewer also plays an important role. Okay, but uh, but the, the artist you know. I would say all artists uh, do have certain intentions when, for example, they paint or when they make a piece of sculpture. Okay, they do have certain intentions. Okay, even though the work may look intuitive or spontaneous, okay, they are guided by certain aesthetic choices. Okay, so, so what does the artist emphasize visually? Okay, because some artists, you know, I mean, artists are really talented, skillful people. Uh, not all of them. <laughs> anyway, um, but the the most you know the better ones, okay, they are able to make you see things, right? Uh, yeah, they are, they are able to mani manipulate your you know the way you you see the painting. Okay, and how does the artist emphasize those features? Okay, I mean those are formal elements. So composition is it unified? So is that unity? Right, in the composition, is it balanced, for example? Right? How is the idea or emotion of the work conveyed? Now it's very important, you know, the, the formal elements of the work are closely linked with the meaning. Okay, um, you know, because ultimately you know the formal elements um, will tell you, you know, the kind of the thoughts, the feelings, the emotions, the idea that the artists want to convey visually. Okay, so, for example, one very basic example is uh, you know in the Renaissance there are many paintings of cross, uh, crucifixion of Jesus. You just look at two of them, and no two are alike. Although the subject is, is the same, because the artists have you know intention to to convey different meanings in their work. Okay, so some show Jesus you know kind of victorious, others show Jesus for example suffering. You know? right. So so. You know, so formal elements are used differently to convey different meanings. Uh, scale as well. Is the work figurative or abstract? I think those are basic questions, you know. Just another slide. Colors, right? How are colors used? I mean, color is one of the most important formal elements in a painting. Okay, so, so those are important questions to ask. Right? Are warm or cool colors used? Right? What mood or emotion are conveyed by the colors? Um, ah, and someone talking about gestures, right? Gestures. So, are the marks of the tools visible? Okay. And and of course, some artists want to make right the tools of their trade. I mean, the marks of, of their, their their tools visible on the painting. Okay. Um, yeah, some like that kind of uh, rough appearance, you know, or kind of unfinished appearance. But some artists prefer their you know their paintings to be more finished. Okay, and then you ask yourself, is there con you know, 
contrast between areas of light and dark. Okay, does this create a kind of three-dimensional illusion? Um, yeah, and then it's a sense of texture of smooth surface. So all these are questions you can ask. For Cezanne. Okay, I'm sure you've seen uh, Cezanne's work somewhere. I mean, it's really one of the uh, one of the greatest painters who ever lived. Painter. And you know, Cezanne has been called a painter's painter. I mean, that's really, uh, you know, a, you know, a tribute to him, a painter's painter. Okay, because he was only concerned with, uh, you know, the, the formal properties of painting, the act, the act of painting itself. Right. I mean, I mean, I mean, subject is probably secondary to him. Okay, he's concerned really with uh, kind of resolving uh, technical problems of painting. What effects could be caused, you know, by certain colors, right? Uh, you know, on lines. Okay, but Cezanne, if you if you know, you know, he's uh, what he call he's, he's very much concerned with the structure of the painting, the structure. Okay, how you know the colors and the lines, all that, you know, uh, contribute to the overall, you know, the, the, the structural integrity of the painting. Okay? So there must be a certain kind of a visual balance, proportion. The painting, um, and uh, he's a very slow worker, you know, and that's because of the way he applied, you know, the paint. Um, you know, he applied the paint in a very methodical way, and um, so that's why when you look at his works, um, you know, even the fruits here, okay, there's a certain presence in them. There's a certain weight. Because of the way he painted, right, he uses uh, you know um, brush strokes that, that kind of resemble you know um, geometric shapes. Okay, the way he kind of moved the brush. Um, yeah, so you know um, his famous uh, phrase is you know seen in nature the cylinder, the sphere, and the cone. Right, in his paintings, you know, he tried to reduce his um, his objects to fundamental shapes. Right, the cylinder, the sphere. And the cone. And in terms of, I mean, he has uh, kind of um, disregarded, right, the conventions of, of uh, previous painting. Okay, like the use of uh, perspective. Okay, if you look at Cezanne's work, you know, he, when you look at his still life, for example, you know, he shows you the objects there through multiple perspective. Okay, so his works may look a bit out of proportion and all that, but you know, it was deliberately done. And um, okay, but, but anyway, that's that's his one. But this is a work called Still Life with Compotier. Now, Compotier is a food dish, right? So the food dish is there. You, you see it there on the on the upper left. And um, now, what do you say when you look at a work like this? Okay, you know, if if you don't know the formal language you know, or the language of describing art, you will say that oh, I see uh, at some fruits, a knife. A half filled, what's that glass? And you stop there, you know. I mean, that's a pity if you do that. Right. Um, of course, you know, there's more to it than, than just those those things. I mean, when you look at the Cezanne, it's really about the formal elements of the work. How you use colors, right. okay? How you use uh, uh, composition, the composition of the work. Okay, for example. So all those are more important questions to ask in this work, rather than the subject. Okay, for the subject you can't say you can't say much, right? Just still life. What can you say about still life? Okay, nothing much. So I'm just going to show you one example, you know, like Roger Fry was an art critic. Okay, and I think he has written a book about Cezanne's work. And um, here it's just one or two sentences, right? Of course, there are much more okay, of how he described uh, uh, um, Cezanne's painting, that painting that you saw. Okay, where he talks about the brush stroke, the direction of the brush, okay, and all that. Okay, so he says, Cezanne has abandoned altogether the sweep of a broad, bar, a broad brush, builds up his masses by a succession of head strokes. Head strokes are those parallel strokes, okay, with a small brush. 
then uh, this direction of the brush stroke is carried through without regard to the contours. Wow, I really can't write like this, you know. It's tough. I tell you, formal descriptions are extremely difficult to write. That's why nobody writes like this anymore. Okay? Uh, today, even when describing a painting, okay, a lot of people just talk about the context, you know, oh, this one refers to certain issues, you know. Right? That's about it. They don't do formal description of this. Right? It takes a lot of uh, skill, it takes a lot of uh, you know, your, your command of language to, to write like this. But this is what I mean. Okay, about you know when you want to describe the formal element of the world, just on a brush stroke. Can you see that? I mean, not even you know talking about the colors yet. Okay, so okay, um, more on formal analysis. I think I'm gonna speed it up a little bit. Anyone knows about Jackson Pollock? You've seen Pollock, so huh? Okay. Um, Jackson Pollock was an American artist and uh, you know, he, he and uh, a few other artists started the, what they call the Abstract Expressionist Movement okay, in New York back in the 1940s okay, or post-war around that, that period and uh, Pollock really was the one who helped to revive American art and because of him and you know, the abstract expressionist artist, New York became the center of the art world. Okay, previously it was Paris, he now New York. And he's famous for his style of painting. Okay, what style is that? Like this. Right? Never done before. You put your canvas on the floor. Right? You take a can of, I don't know, you know, in those kind of um, house paint, okay, industrial paint. Okay, you take a trowel, not a brush. Okay, and then you go around the canvas and just fling the paint and you know, right? Okay, splash it around, uh, uh, you know, um, drip, drip, drip them on the canvas. That's about it. Right? And uh, that's his style of painting. So Pollock actually uh, departed from the European tradition of painting. Right? Oh. He really uh, kind of um, uh, started his own method. Invented his own method of painting. Um, yeah, and I mean it's very controversial. I mean his personal life aside, I mean Pollock is a, was a like a part, you know, right? <laughs> he was uh, you read his life, but I won't go into that, right? Um, but as an artist, you know he he's, he was extremely innovative. Okay, although um, you know today people still dismiss his work, you know, as kind of you know nothing much, you know, rubbish. And, yeah, but this has got nothing to do with uh, Pollock, right? It's a pizza. It will keep me hungry again, maybe after this. <laughs> now, all of you have eaten pizza before, I imagine. Right? Now, if you look at a pizza, okay? what do you see? Now, this is about 16, 16 cm around there, diameter around there, right? It's, it's round, there's a rounded form. Um, it's covered with uh, different ingredients okay, that gives it shape, texture, color. Um, what else? It's covered with a layer of uh, cheese. So what's the similarity between this and Pollock's number three? Okay, I mean, on the surface, maybe not much. Okay, because Pollock's one is about three by five kind of feet. Okay, for this painting at least. Um, it's more rectangular. Um, you can't eat it for sure. Um, okay, and so those are the differences, but if you look at it, both are concerned with what? Presentation. Okay. Composition, presentation. I mean, would you want to eat a pizza where all the olives are on one side? Okay? I mean, it probably looks like a pizza. Right? Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes, we spread around, right? Okay. Yes, we well composed. So they share similarities. 
Okay, the right the pizza and the uh, hot dogs. Color. Right, so colors. You know, you see, for example, you know the the use of uh, vivid red and green uh, peppers, glossy, you know, olives, black olives. Okay, um, brown mushrooms, and then Pollock's work. You see, um, yeah, a few kind of colors being used. Reds as well, greens, yellow, mustard yellow, and of course, uh, there's some blue as well. And uh, like, like the pizza, right? Those colors are also spread around. Evenly throughout the canvas. Now notice I, I showed you earlier how Pollock painted. He just threw paint, but you know, he was able to achieve this effect and that's quite that's really quite amazing. To have that kind of control. Right? So Pollock is really a, a kind of a, you know a mix of chance and control really. Um, if you were to follow all the colours, let's say the mustard yellow with your eyes. Okay, you can see that it recurs at strategic points. Right? It's not just all one side or you know, clump on one side. But you know, if you follow it. Okay, so so Pollock was kind of conscious of what right? he was doing okay, to, to achieve such effects. Okay, what else? You know what other similarities you see? Rounded forms. Rounded forms. Okay, so the rounded forms in the case in the case of the pizza are of course the crust, the round form of the crust, and then of course uh, certain ingredients like the olives, the mushrooms, right? Okay, the curved form. Okay, in, uh, likewise in Pollock's work as well, right? You see the curved form as well because um, and the curve the curved lines are really a result of you know the movements of his hand, right, and his arms. Okay, so curved forms are another kind of uh, similarity you see. And of course, um, irregular surfaces. Irregular surfaces. What I mean by this is uh, really talking about the textures. So different ingredients give the pizza, you know, texture, unevenness, a kind of unevenness, right, to, to the pizza. Like why with, with uh, Pollock's work, you can't really see it here, but if you see it in person, right? It alternates between thin, thick paint. Okay, and uh, it's not uncommon for him as well when he painted, right? And he liked to smoke and all that, you know? To have cigarette butts thrown in the painting. Mm -hmm. It's true, right? Art glass and all that, you know? So you add all these things into his painting for texture. Okay, so, yeah, so as you can see, there are many similarities between the two. Okay, so a well composed, you know, painting <coughs> has to be like a well made piece. Of So when you look at a Pollock work, you know, what, what do you say, you know? Right? You say something like this. Okay. Now what do you think they are saying, you know? What else do you say? His spatter is masterful, but his grips lack conviction. <laughs> I wish I could say that, I mean that's really. You know what I mean by cutting? You understand why spatter, right? Like you throw something, throw paint. Right? His grips lack conviction, you know. It's probably not forceful enough, you know. I'm sure if you are a commercial, you can. Then you being or train eye, you are able to see all this. Whether the brush stroke is weak or strong, you know, especially in Chinese painting, you must be able to do that. Okay, I need to move on. Um, just uh, okay, just in this work, it's amazing work is by Caravaggio. Okay, and Caravaggio was a Baroque painter. Okay, the Baroque period came after the, the Renaissance, and um, and Caravaggio was an independent painter. Okay, and he painted uh, mainly, I would say, religious scenes. Because at that time, um, the Protestant church broke away from the Catholic church. Okay, so, and the Catholic church decided that art okay, was to be a vehicle to, to get more converts. So they were using art right, okay, to, to you know, or emphasize art as a way of uh, you know getting more converts to the Catholic faith, okay. and they specified that you know I mean art should um, be theatrical, dramatic, right? So 
when when you look at the art of um, religious art of Catholic countries, you know, during this time, okay, places like Italy or even France, okay, you see that you know many of these paintings uh, kind of conform to what the Catholic Church wanted, okay, like Caravaggio's work. Okay, Caravaggio's work is always very dramatic and theatrical, okay, and um, so. Now, of course, you know, I don't blame, I mean, again, the, the title, Supper at Emmaus. Now, of course, if you don't know what Emmaus is, or if you're not familiar with the Bible, you need to do a bit more research. But for those who are familiar, at once you know that this was the supper that Jesus had with his disciples after his resurrection, after he rose again from the dead. Okay, so he died, rose again from the dead. He was walking with two disciples. Uh, they didn't recognize him. They invited him for supper. And then when they sat down, then they realized who he was. So Caravaggio captured this story at a point where Jesus revealed his identity. Or at least, you know, when the disciples came to know about his identity. So you could see their reaction. Okay? They, they were almost like, you know, they were shocked. Okay, one is almost falling off his chair. You know, right? That kind of reaction. So I suppose for this kind of traditional paintings, yeah, I mean, I don't blame for just looking at the subject matter first. Okay, because all of our subject matter, okay, rather than the uh, formal uh, elements, but of course the formal elements are very important also. Okay, because as I said, they are linked. Okay, formal elements and meaning of the painting, okay, they are all linked. So for the um, formal elements, Caravaggio was a master of what he called chiaroscuro. Okay, some people will call it cannibalism. Different terms, okay, different terms, but uh, um, they mean more or less the same thing, right? Where uh, the contrast of light and shade. I think in, uh, in, in the case of um, the Mona Lisa, you saw just now, right? Um, Leonardo used chiaroscuro, right? Light and dark to model his figures. Okay, so there, there is uh, almost no use of line. In, uh, you know, in Leonardo's work. Okay, in the, the case of um, Caravaggio, okay, he, he was a master in using tenebrism. Right? Now, tenebrism is uh, a painting style in which, uh, a technique, right, in which, uh, you know, most of the areas of the painting are in darkness. Okay, it's like we shine a spotlight, okay, on something, okay, while the rest are illuminated, right, are lighted up. So he's a, he's a master in using that. You have seen the words of Caravaggio. Another master in use of, of you know using light and dark is uh, of course Rembrandt, a Dutch artist. Okay, but anyway, um, so by using Tenebrism, he created a dramatic effect. Right? He's able to create a dramatic effect. He's able to create a three-dimensional kind of you know illusion as well. Um, so that's one texture. Right, so in terms of texture, if you if you look at it, sorry, it's a bit small here, but if you look at it, you'll see the way that he depicted or he rendered the, the, the clothing of the the figures there, especially also the the food on the table. Look at that, you know. I mean, in, in a sense, you know, he, he gives a tactile effect. Right, to the objects and the figures right, in his painting to make it seem as if they are real and that you could like, actually touch you know, um, the food on the table and then uh, perspective, uh, the foreshortening now the foreshortening you see this um, yeah, wait, my mouse doesn't appear there sure. sorry, okay, never mind ok, you see this guy extending his hand Okay, there, and then you see this guy with his elbow, right, jutting out. Okay, it, so it projects out into our space, right? That's that's a kind of perspective used, and this perspective is known as, as a foreshortening, right? Foreshortened perspective, okay? and uh, you know, and also Christ's uh, extended hand as well. That's a that's also foreshortening. Um, yeah. So so. 
And then the composition, right? The composition is mainly, you know, when you look at Renaissance art, the composition is almost always a triangle. Okay? So, in the Renaissance painting, you have Jesus in the middle, and then you have two other person, it forms a triangle. Jesus at the apex. Even the Last Supper, the same thing. Right? Um, in this case, it still is. Okay, but you have a man standing on the right of Jesus. Now, ever wondered what that does to the composition? It's no longer so balanced. Right? It's no longer so balanced. Now, a Renaissance artist would never have done that. Okay, because that takes away the attention, the focus on Jesus. Okay, we'll come to again, you know, why the question of why you know that was done. And colours. Now, anyone can tell me what colours, how colours are used here? <coughs> what sort of colours are used here? Warm colours, cool colours? You know? Mainly warm colours, right? What, what sort of colours are mostly used? Whites, reds. Okay, and notice how it kind of spreads the colours as well across the canvas. Okay, but anyway, you know, what I mean is that you need to look at the formal elements first because to understand how, you know, the intention of the artist to convey, um, you know, the meaning of his work, right? Because, as I mentioned before, you know, it's, it's, a, it's at a point where the, the disciples had a shock, a good kind of uh, discovery that, you know, they were with Jesus, right? So, of course, the use of um, pentebrism, you know, to create dramatic effects, the fact that you have this man standing there, this other figure, to make everything kind of unbalanced, okay, and then you have the use of foreshortening, okay, all this contribute to the meaning of the picture, right? It all contributes to the subject itself. Okay, so so really, sometimes the formal elements cannot be divorced from the subject. Okay, they are they are all linked. Okay, next we come to theme. Um, now, theme can be conveyed in three ways. Um, to the, the, the subject matter of the work, right? What you see. Okay, what you see. Okay, the subject matter. And uh, then you go into the symbolic meaning, or what you call iconography of the work. Now, don't be daunted by this, this term, iconography. Is okay. Well, I'll explain that later on. Okay, that goes beyond the subject matter. That goes beyond the subject. Okay, and then uh, of course, uh, you know. So, so these are the the, the 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 theme of the work, right? The subject itself, the content, the kind of the symbolic meaning of the work. Okay. Um, so, what is iconography? Now, iconography was this. Um, I would call it a method. Okay, a method of analyzing art. Okay, so you have to remember that in art itself, in art history, okay, many art historians have come up with different methods, right, to look at art, to analyze art. So Panofsky came up with this method called iconography, right, and it's a, a branch of art history which studies the identification, description, and interpretation of the content of images. For example, very simple example. I don't know whether there's. Okay, but if you look at, for example, a Buddha image, how do you know it's a Buddha? Right? How do you know it's a Buddha? Okay, so you look, you look at the things that you know is able to identify that object or that image as a Buddha. Okay, the for example the uh, the palm on the head, right? The hand gestures, right? The the, the, the pedestal, right? So there are certain things that identify. Right, um, that figure as a Buddha, and of course, that's the most basic level. There are like hundreds of Buddhas. You know, how do you identify each one? Okay, because each one has different uh, traits, different attributes. Okay, you can. So that's really the business of iconography is to identify figures. Right? So Panofsky gave 
um, a bit more importance to subject and to meaning rather than to formal, you know, the formal qualities of art. Okay, and it's uh, the most famous work that he had kind of uh, applied this method to. And in fact, he wrote it in a magazine called the Burlington Magazine. I think it's 1934. It's uh, this painting itself called Amofini Double Portrait. Now, in some books, you'll, you'll find, you'll come across this title as the Amofini Wedding or the Amofini Marriage. But the National Gallery, of course, you know, they want to kind of play a bit safer. Okay, they say it's the Amofini Double Portrait, which is not wrong. Okay, but uh, originally, you know, Panofsky's, Panofsky called it the Amofini Wedding. Right? And, uh, you know, he kind of uh, presented his argument as to why this whole painting depicts a wedding. Not only that, he argues further that this painting itself, you know, when you go to, uh, what's that place, Registry of America, ROM, right? Okay, they give you a certificate. So, Panofsky's argue that this painting itself is a certificate. Right? I'll come to that, but anyway, I just want to, I mean, again, one of the most famous paintings right, in the world, right? So many books have been written just on this painting, right? Just on this painting, because, you know, um, different scholars have different views on this painting. And when Panofsky came out with his view, a lot of people have gone out to challenge him. So today we know that some of his views are wrong. Okay, uh, we, can, we can say that it's not a wedding, because records show that this couple actually married uh, I think 10 years later or something, right? 10 years after this painting was done. But they were married. So it could be a bit throttle. Okay, so he's not he's not wrong in that sense. Now um so this is um Giovanni and Giovanna right? Amofini, right? They both come from both came from Italy, migrated from Italy to Bruch. Bruch is in uh is it Holland? Yeah. Modern, I think. Okay, and uh, so it's a portrait. So they commissioned Young and I okay, to paint this portrait. And now, again, when you look at this painting, at first glance on the surface, okay, so I mean, the National Gallery in London calls it Anofini Double Portrait. So to you, it's a portrait. Yes. You look more closely, you say, wow, this is a portrait of a wealthy. You know, couple, definitely, right? Then you look at the objects, of course, you know, look at the chandelier, look at the mirror, right, the back, okay, and uh, what else? Look at the lavish costumes that they wear with kind of fur trim, you know, kind of costumes, right, that they wear. Okay, um, so definitely, I mean, this whole painting is about that. It's about the display of power, of money. Okay, and, and that's what the elites were doing at that time. They commissioned these this, such portraits to display, right? As a kind of a, a sign of their wealth. But Panofsky went further, right? He went to uncover the, uh, the deeper kind of, you know, the meaning of this work. Okay, and that's what, that's where iconography comes in handy. Okay, where, um, you know, and, but, I have to add that iconography is sometimes culturally specific. Okay? Meaning that if you don't come from the culture, you probably wouldn't know what it is. Okay, so some of the objects used in this painting would be known to people living at that time. But maybe to us, it may not be so obvious anymore. Right? So an art historian has to do a lot of research. Okay, to come up with uh, that conclusion. Okay, so Panofsky look at this. Right, and Yang Van Eyck was what you call a Flemish. Was he a Flemish artist? No, maybe a yeah, Flanders. He comes from Flanders, right? A place which is equivalent to uh, Belgium today. Okay. So in um, Flemish paintings, in Netherlandish paintings, you know, Dutch paintings, um, it's quite common, okay, uh, for those paintings to show this kind of interior, okay, with this kind of uh, very mundane objects or everyday objects, but hiding a significance, a deeper significance in these objects. So Panofsky saw it, 
say that each of these objects have different meanings. The candle, the chandelier has a one lighted candle. And normally the one lighted candle stands for the presence of God. Okay, the presence of God. The all-seeing eye of God. And uh, there is also um, other things like um, the mirror. Okay, the mirror itself has ten scenes of the passion, the passion of Christ. So religious references, and then you have uh, references to marriage and fertility. Um, you have um, what do you have there? The dog. Okay, of course, it's a pet dog, right? Again, the pet dog is a, a, a symbol of wealth, undoubtedly. Okay, but here in this context, okay, Panofsky is argue that the dog itself is a symbol of marital fidelity marital fidelity and you also see um, uh, now again uh, um, you, you see the, the statue there right not very clear but it's a statue of St. Margaret okay, St. Margaret is the patron of childbirth so I mean you know, one cannot blame Panofsky for, for, for arguing that this, this actually depicts a marriage. Okay, because you have those uh, symbols there. And, um, and then finally, um, you look at the man and the woman. Right. Now, is the woman really pregnant? Maybe you say yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> she looks pregnant, right? Yes. Okay, did I? Yes. Okay, sorry, at that time in our society, it was taboo to be pregnant, you know? I don't know, you could be, you know, kind of uh, thrown out by a family or something like that. Okay, by this painting, she wants to show that she is, but she's not, of course, right? So she wants to show that, you know, she will have, she will bear children in the future. It's another kind of sign of fertility, right? Single fertility. Um, Okay, so, but there are so many other things here, right? I mean, the, the oranges on the windowsill. Okay, oranges are the, one of the most expensive fruits, okay, at that time. Okay, um, and as I said, this is a controversial painting because different people see it differently. Okay, um, later on, I'll just kind of refer again, you know, to, to uh, you know, for example, families. Okay, families are, are those who champion women's rights. So in art history, you have um, feminist art historians. Okay, when you look at this painting, right, um, you know, they look at a woman. Okay, and they say that, wow, you know, this is another painting that shows woman is a kind of pawn, you know, in a kind of arranged marriage, you know. Okay, it, it, it portrays woman again in a very negative light. Look at a man, look at the way he holds her hand. You know, he holds her hand with his left hand. She opens up, up her palm in you know, like being receptive to him, okay, being subservient. Okay, and the fact that he's you know shown much taller than her, right? Okay, he's trying to show the superiority of men. So you have those feminist approaches. So there are many approaches, you know, Marxist approach, you know, Marxist as in Marxism, right? Okay, they look at the economic um, kind of uh, side of this painting. Okay, the wealth displayed and all that. So you can, you know, for one painting you can have many approaches that right? you can take, right? A number of different approaches to look at it. Okay, lastly, um, context. Okay, context refer to the, uh, the social political conditions that surround the work of art. Uh, I think I, I mentioned this already, right? It could be politics, it could be uh, Social issues like race, right? Identity, um, gender. Okay, for example, right. So those are the kind of social, you know, kind of issues. Okay, so context is also important to, to put the work in a broader kind of, uh, you know, um, uh, context. And um, so. So again, you know, art historians use different approaches, okay, to look at context, okay, to look at the kind of multiple influences behind art and its meaning. Okay, so for example, um, art historians have developed 
different methodological framework. Now, don't worry about this, right? It's just different approaches, right? Okay. Approaches, right? To looking at art. Okay, so you have the Marxists, as I, as I said, who look at art, who look at the economic kind of uh, you know, conditions of art. Um, some look at uh, the feminists, right? They look at how women are portrayed in art. Okay, they argue that, you know, many of these paintings showing, uh, you know, um, a new woman, you know, they are made exclusively for the male gains, right? Uh, by male artists. Okay, things like that. Psychoanalysis, you know, you, you look at how, um, for example, um, you know, a certain artwork represents, you know, or, or could give clues to the, um, the, the younger kind of um, life of the artist himself, right? How it's linked to the artist's own life, right? Same thing with biographical. Okay, so there are many approaches, right? So you look at the, the broader context. For example, if you look at Van Gogh's work, okay, you might want to, because, you know, he kind of suffered from Right, mental illness and all that. So it played a very important role in his work, right? That kind of mental illness has suffered. And, uh, you know, so it's important, very important to look at how that context, right, influenced his work. So I just want to end up with three paintings. Okay, maybe I'll just give up with brief. Okay, Thomas Gainsborough, Robert Andrews and his wife. Um, now Thomas Gainsborough, right? You, you, if you go to the National Gallery of London, you see, you know, dozens of his works there. Um, you know, arguably one of the most famous British artists of the 18th century. Okay, and uh, Gainsborough was really one of the. You know, he, he kind of gave. You know, he he he, he couldn't. He came to a realization that he couldn't sell um, just by painting portraits alone. Okay, or the other way around, maybe just by painting landscapes. Okay, so what he did was that he combined the two. So he became quite famous for that, right? Combining, you know, portrait, right, of people in a landscape setting. Okay, so that's what he did here. But uh, when Robert Andrews and his wife commissioned him, he was a very young artist, about 23 years old, not so famous yet. Okay, so they didn't know the fame that he was to gain later. And um, you can see that they are very young. I don't know whether they even reached their twenties, right? Okay, and um, recently married, extremely wealthy, okay. and um, and obviously this painting was commissioned again as a display of their possessions, their status, right? If you look at the wife's face, huh? look at the expression. She looks at you like with disdain, you know, like, looking down on you, you know, right? Okay? And she has this very, uh, you know, wry kind of smile. You know? right? It's how, you know, sometimes the rich look at the poor, you know. Okay, that kind of look. Anyway, and then the husband is there, you know, standing with a rifle under his arm, you know. Right? And you look at them, they look very pale, you know, right? Pale, a bit, a bit, a bit. Life. I mean, because there are people who never work a day in their life. You know? All those things you see there are inheritance. In fact, uh, Robert's inheritance, they already come from like, today what we call like high net worth you know, families. Right? The super rich. And you know, by marrying into another rich family, he became even wealthier. Okay, so I think as a dowry, he was given, uh, you know, um, more land by the girl's father. Okay. So already it wasn't, you know. Anyway, what I'm, what I'm describing to you, right, I'm, I'm looking at the, the, the context of the world. I mean, maybe I, I kind of try to apply the kind of, you know, the Marxist way of looking at things, right, at economic power, okay, um, you know, that, that a painting can convey. Right? Um, and the fact that, uh, you know, Thomas Gainsborough used oil paint. This is oil on canvas, right? And you know, oil on canvas can really capture that detail that you know other mediums can't. So here, you know, he used oil to kind of you know present their wealth in all its its glory. Um, and the composition is also composition is also very interesting. So that's why composition can never be disregarded, right? 
right? He must, I mean the former elements. You notice that it's quite unusual as well. They are, sh they are shifted to just to the left. You can say that. Anyone wants to know what kind of... Can you see all the land there? Right? It's as far as the eye can see. That's what they wanted, you know? The artist to capture. All that land is theirs. Right? You can see cows grazing, sheep. They are sitting on the edge of a wheat field. The wheat field is there. You can see the wheat field is so neat. It tells you what? It tells you that, you know, it was done with the aid of the latest, you know, uh, technology. And at that time, there was this uh, man called Jethro Tao. Right? And Jethro Tao's uh, seed drill was invented at around the same time. So when we, when we use this approach, when we adopt this approach, we look at this thing, right? How the painting conveys status and power. And that's what John Berger says, right? I want to recommend a book to you. It's called Ways of Seeing by John Berger. It's a small thin book by Penguin. You can still get it anywhere. Kino, you know, um, yeah, online bookstores. Okay. He comes from a leftist point of view, more Marxist approach. Okay. And uh, he says that you know, the, the pleasure of seeing themselves depicted as landowners, okay, and this pleasure was enhanced by the oil paint, right? The oil paint to render the land in, in all its glory. Okay. And uh, yeah, and, and sometimes artists are complicit in this, you know, I mean they are they, they, I mean sometimes you know, it's difficult, I mean like they have to place their client and all that. Okay, but if you look at the other two quotes, the other two quotes look more at just the formal elements, you know. They don't look at the context. Okay, both famous art historians, right? Lawrence Gowing says philosophic enjoyment of unperverted nature. Very nice description, but you know, it doesn't tell you much. Right? The enchanting, this enchanting work is painted with love and mastery. Okay? I mean, we all, we all agree with that, right? But what's the context? What's, you know, what else do, does this painting want to convey? So we need to look more closely at what is beyond the surface. We need to look at the painting beyond the, against the grain, right? So to speak, against the grain. Okay, same thing, this one um, just briefly, you know, to show you a contemporary uh, South Asian work. In this case, it's a Thai work. Uh, I mean, like, a work by a Thai artist, very famous Thai artist, uh, Wasan, the Wasan Syndicate. Okay, the V is pronounced as Wasan, right? Wasan Syndicate. Um, and, I mean, he's a multidisciplinary artist. I mean, he, he performs, he writes poetry, okay? um, he also sculpts. Okay, this one, you know, uh, it's a painting. And this Lord Buddha visits Thailand. It's a contemporary painting. And uh, it's interesting to note, as I mentioned earlier, you know, especially in, uh, in the context of South Asia, okay, um, quite a number of artists in South Asia, they still kind of um, make references to their tradition and culture, right? And to their religion. Okay, so in this case, it's Buddhism. Not that they are necessarily religious. Okay, it's just that, you know, they actually make references to the culture. So here, Vasan Sitiket, um, you know, I mean, the main figure here is the Buddha, the walking Buddha, you know, this is for Sokotai, right? The Sokotai invented the walking Buddha. So he incorporated the image of walking Buddha, but it's not a religious image. He incorporated it to talk about, you know, social and political issues plaguing Thailand. If you look at the vignettes, Okay, the different vignettes then. Okay. He show you, he, he talks about the, he, he, I mean his intention is to talk about the corruption, the greed, the debauchery of Thai society. On the upper right, you see naked people, you know, right, having sex and all that. Right? And, this, and there's a caption there, Welcome to Thailand. And then, on, um, at the bottom, and what do you see? Do you see Taksin, right? Taksin there is with a prostitute. Okay. And he's holding a sack of money. Right? And then you have the yellow shirts and the red shirts. Okay, of course the, the red shirts uh, were the ones who supported Taxi. Right? And I think some of these artists they're also very political. Like Wasan, I think is a yellow shirt. So 
you know, they also take sides and all that, right? So you have the yellow shirts, red shirts, and then monasteries as well, you know, a lot of monks today, you know, they get indicated, right? For corruption and, you know, uh, debased living and all that. So you can see, I mean, like, here, you know, Wasan is clearly taught. And that's what's interesting about Southeast Asian art. Okay. I think with the exception of Singapore, right? Okay. I don't know, Singaporean artists tend to avoid all those. I think because, partly because censorship, right? There's a lot of censorship here as well, so artists are a bit more guarded as to what, you know? I mean, you have to do a, a painting like this here, ooh, right? Next day, someone invite you for coffee, right? That's it, okay? Anyway, um, so you have to be a bit more, yeah, you can do paintings like this, but you know, you have to code it, right? You can't make it so obvious. And, um, okay, so anyway, so the last painting is actually a painting, a Singapore painting. They are painting by Singapore artists. Whether that's uh, anyway, if you want to see this, you can easily see it at the National Gallery because it's considered to be one of the treasures of our collection. Tromiati's National Language Class. Um, have you guys seen it? Anyone seen this in person at the National Gallery? Yes. Yeah. And uh, very well painted, you know. I mean. Tromiati is uh, really an accomplished painter, undoubtedly. Fortunately, today is just uh, it's just a commercial painter, you know. So if client wants some goldfish or koi, he just paints them and paint it, you know. But by that time, you know, in the in the in the 60s, 70s, right, he was uh, really a right one of the more uh, important artists. Um, and this is probably his most. Uh, you know, famous work. I mean, not only his, but you know, in, in terms of uh, Singapore art, right? One of the most famous work in Singapore's art history. Okay, the National Language Class. Now, um, when you look at this painting again, of course, you know, the the formal elements, of course, also must come into play. Okay, but again, maybe that will take a back seat. Right, you are more interested in what's happening here. Right, you look at the title, National language class, yes. So you look at the subject. Well, there's a um, teacher there. It looks like a Malay, and you confirm it by looking at the words on the on the board. Okay, it's in Malay, so it must be a Malay kind of language class taking place. And obviously, these are the students. Okay, and then you can describe. Okay, you can see they come from diverse backgrounds. Indian, Chinese, okay? They probably come from different kind of um, economic background as well. Okay, some are dressed in more kind of stylish clothing. Some are students, okay? Um, yeah. But, as I said, art is always a matter of interpretation. Okay, so some people have gone further to try to interpret this painting. Okay, again, to read, to read against the grain. Right, to go beyond the surface. So what else can we say about this painting? Okay. Maybe it's not so obvious, but if you do enough research, okay, you'll be able to uncover more clues. 1959, a year. Okay. What's happening then? What happened during that year? Yep. Singapore achieved self what do you call that? Self-independence? Self-government. Self-government. Self yeah. Self-government, that's right. Okay. Very um, And um, not, not yet independence, but you're right, self-government. What was happening then in the 50s? A lot of things. Strikes, riots, okay, by uh, so-called communist elements in Singapore. And then you go further and you, you'll find that Tromiati was a member of the Equator Art Society. Now, the Equator Art Society was um, a society of artists. Okay, they were devoted to, um, you know, um, you know, creating works that deal with uh, what was going on at that time, the realities of life, right? With uh, social concerns. Okay, with the plight of the masses, the ordinary people. 
So, so they, so that 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 this kind of art is called social realism. Right? It's it's realistic. Okay, although not kind of, you know, in a photo photographic way, but realistic, and it deals with social issues, right? So that's why it's known as social realism. Okay, and um, so if you try to piece all these clues together, and then what does the what the, what what do those words on the on the board says? Okay, it's in Malay, Siapa Nama Kamu. Right? Okay, that's the name of the gallery if you go to the National Gallery, right? It's the Siapa Nama Kamu. What is your name? Where do you live? Now, of course, in, um, when you go to a language class, um, these are basic questions you ask, right? What's your name? Where do you live? You learn about these basic phrases. But you piece all these things together, okay, the fact that Chomiati. Uh, oh, I forgot to mention that of course the Equator Society, right, as you know, they are concerned with, with social kind of issues, right? Um, they were also suspected of sympathizing with the uh, the more leftist, okay, I wouldn't say com right, communist elements at that time. Right? And uh, and also um, you know uh, and also the things that were going on then, the political situation where the communists were staging strikes, right? They were fighting against the British, they were fighting for independence, okay, uh, you know, uh, and, and all those things, right? The anti-colonial sentiments that were going on. You piece all these things together.